Good afternoon. My name is Natasha Midorsky, a member of the City Club Youth Forum Council. I'm a junior at Cleveland Heights High School, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's forum, The Truth Like You've Never Heard It Before, featuring Stephanie Sizemore Tolar. Stephanie knows the decisions she makes today will affect, her, will affect her for the rest of her life. She learned the hard way, and she's not afraid to talk about it. She spent the majority of her life trying to be perfect and wearing a mask. Everyone thought she had it all together, and by the time she was 28, she was earning six figures in the business world and on her way to a life of success and wealth. Little did anyone know that behind the mask, Stephanie had endured years of abuse and trauma and had struggled with addictions for most of her life. Today, Stephanie spends a lot of her time talking about what she knows best, her life. Stephanie Tolar has been doing public speaking for three years and has spoken at over 50 events and to approximately 10,000 high school students. She works with youth as a part-time ministry assistant at Grace Church and is starting her own nonprofit, Simply Bold, a marketing company focused on helping people help people. Stephanie has a degree in journalism and a year of graduate work completed in counseling. So please welcome Stephanie Sizemore Tolar. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. How's everybody doing? Good. 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 A lovely bunch. I love that. Before we get started, we're going to do a little activity. We're going to do a little icebreaker. Don't worry about it. It's not going to be one of those weird games, but I do want everybody to stand up. I know. I know. It's like she's making us stand. Okay. Okay. So I need everybody from this section on, look at me. I need you all to sit down. That was quick and easy, right? That's it? 50%, 50% of high school students report having sex by the time they graduate from high school. 50%. Decisions you make today, they're going to impact your life whether you like it or not. Okay, now for those that are standing, I need you guys to raise your hand. Just raise your hand. See, that was simple. If you raised your right hand, sit down. Seventy. <laughs> Sorry, we have just few left-handers. According to the CDC, this year in the United States alone, we'll have 19 million new cases of STDs. 19 million. Listen to this, guys. 10 million of those are going to be high school and college students. The rules apply to you. For those of you are who are still standing, I need two volunteers. It's going to be all right. Okay. There's one. You're volunteering. Come on up. Everybody else, sit down. Come on up. 70, 75% of high school students report consuming alcohol by the time they graduate from high school. 75%. 30% of those will drink before the eighth grade. 90% of the alcohol you consume is done in the form of binge drinking. Your stories, they're being written right here and right now. So we have these two brave souls. We have Austin with a question mark. You're not sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with it for today. And then Taylor? Okay, Austin, I need you to pick red or green. Hmm, green. Green. <laughs> and the answer is red. Taylor, I'm happy to announce. Well, you know what? You oh. have. <laughs> Taylor has just oh. won a not so crisp, not so new, but very valuable ten dollar bill. You know Congratulations, you guys can sit down. <laughs> he was like, "Oh, I got to think again, right?" <laughs> Little did Taylor know that basic decisions she made today. We're going to make her $10 richer than when she walked in today. Where she sat, simple decision. Which hand she raised, simple decision. Well, you made the red or green, simple decision. That's life, right? Life is made up of a bunch of little decisions every single day. And we think, these are, these are insignificant. They don't really matter. But the truth is, Every decision we make puts us on a path to another decision, and then another decision, and then another decision. 
So those insignificant, small decisions that you're making today, those are going to turn into big, significant decisions down the road. My question to you is, do you know where you're headed? Do you know the path that you are on? Because we're all going somewhere. In those paths, in those decisions, those make up our life story, right? We all have a story. All of you have a story. And I'm here to tell you that your stories are being written right here and right now. I don't want to freak anybody out, but you are in the time of your life when you are making decisions that are going to lay the foundation of who you are going to be in the kind of life you are going to live. And I know you're like, whoa, girl, that is a lot of pressure. We're just in high school, right? So you're going to learn about me. I don't like to sugarcoat things. And I'm going to be honest with you and tell you that your decisions right now, they count. They matter. Because you are writing the story of your life right now. And today I'm going to share one of those life stories. A story that I have told many times. My life story. My life story started 32 years ago. I was born in Medina, Ohio. My parents got divorced when I was five. And then they got remarried when I was 10. Like, they got back together with each other. Isn't that weird? I know. And everybody always says, like, oh, that is so great. Your parents got back together. Oh, and they lived happily ever after. And I'm like, you know, it wasn't that great. Because I used to have, like, two rooms and two holidays and get out of groundings, you know. But no, but really... The thing was, in growing up in my house, and some of you guys can understand this, I came far hot from a house where we didn't talk. No, we didn't walk around in silence, but we didn't talk about serious stuff like fears, insecurities, pressure, and stress. You know, we could talk about the Indians or the Cavs. We could talk about, like, American Idol or the weather, but we didn't talk about real stuff. And I work with teenagers every day, and they tell me all the time, Stephanie, I cannot talk to my parents. It's awkward. It's weird. They don't listen. They lecture. And I get that. Because in my house, we didn't talk. And when my parents got back together, nobody talked to me about it. And in my mind, they got divorced once. They could get divorced again. Unless I was on my best behavior. And so I started to develop this attitude and this personality of perfectionism. I just wanted to be perfect. And I don't want to brag, but I've always been one of those really annoying people that is good at, like, everything she does. You know? I know everyone just rolled their eyes and thought about somebody. Yeah. <laughs> I know. You know, as a teenager in middle school and high school, I was really good at sports. I was pretty. I was in the popular crowd. I was invited to all the right parties. I had the right clothes. I got a new car at 16. I was on the homecoming court. I was in student council, got good grades. I had it all together. But inside, it never felt like it was good enough. Because I was striving to be perfect, and we always come up short. And in high school, you know, just in growing up in general, my dad and I, we had a really great relationship. But my dad's favorite phrase growing up was, Stephanie, you got to raise the bar. And he always did that stupid hand gesture that parents do. What my dad didn't know is that I got the lesson. I understood what he was saying. He was saying, your goals have to be high. You don't want them to be on the ground. I got that. But what he didn't know because we didn't talk is every time he told me to raise that bar, what I heard, Stephanie, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. It was never enough. And then I had a mom. We also had a good relationship. But, oh, mothers and daughters, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My mom had a rough childhood, and I kind of felt like my mom was trying to live through me. And that's a lot of pressure. I hate when parents do that. It's hard enough to be a teen, and then to have your parents try to, like, correct their childhood through you, it's too much. And it just felt like it wasn't enough. And then I'd go to school, and I got good grades, but there was always more. There was always another test. I played sports, and I excelled, but it was never perfect. It was never enough. You know, and then society was like, you're not thin enough, you don't have the right hair, you don't have the right car, you know, you don't live on Jersey Shore, like, it's just not enough. <laughs> and, like, I just never felt like I was enough. And then when I was a junior in high school, I met this guy. Oh, yeah, you better believe that he told me I was enough. <laughs> you know, he's like, you're so pretty, you're so smart, oh, you're just so perfect. And I was like... 
sign me up for this guy. You know, and we fell in love. And I had it all planned out. We were going to graduate from high school, then we were going to go to college together, we were going to graduate from college, then we were going to get married, we are going to have a boy, a girl, a dog, and we are going to live happily ever after. We laugh, but I talk to so many students that have these thoughts that the person they're with is who they're going to end up with. I got to be honest, probably not. Get real with yourself. So I'm dating this guy and we're in love and we have our first fight. And you know what happens. You see the other side of this perfect person. And my boyfriend calls me a slut. How dare he is right. But who here has ever said something and then later regretted it? Hello, welcome to being a human. So my boyfriend called me a slut, but then he was like, oh, I'm so sorry, you're so pretty, everything's good. And I'm like, okay, the wedding's back on. Here we go. <laughs> the next time, though, the next time I was a stupid slut. Then I was a whore, and I was fat, ugly, worthless. Nobody would ever love me. And then one time, he shoved me, threw me down a flight of stairs, punched me, kicked me, threatened me with a gun. I was being verbally, emotionally, physically abused. And then I thought, well, you know what? If we start having sex, that'll make it better. Yeah, that was stupid. Because then I was sexually abused as well. I was 17 years old. And nobody knew. Because I would walk into Benina High School every day and I'd be like, everything's fine, everything's perfect, everything's wonderful. I would put up that mask. You guys know that mask, right? That mask we wear because we don't want people to know what's really going on in our lives, what's really going on in our hearts. I wasn't that girl. I had said I would never let a guy do that to me. Oh, but when the words I never enter your head or come out of your mouth, be careful. Because I think God just sits up there and he's like, really? Let's find out. Perfect example. Not all of you, but a lot of you when you were younger probably said or thought, I will never swear. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> How's that working out for you? And so nobody knew. Because I put on this perfect image, but inside I was dying. I had so much stress and so much pressure. And to deal with it, I turned to drugs and alcohol. Because when I was high and when I was drunk, I was enough. And I was on top of the world. And people always tell me, Stephanie, drugs and alcohol don't work. And I'm like, have you ever been wasted? Trust me, it works. <laughs> but it works, but it works temporarily. Right? It's a short-term solution to lifelong problems because you always wake up the next day and all your problems are back. So I would just do more drugs and more alcohol. Finally, when I was a senior, my boyfriend punched me on the way to prom and I said, enough is enough, and I broke up with him. And that summer, I just got wasted because I didn't want to deal with life. I ended up going to Bowling Green State University. I played soccer there. My dream since I was a five-year-old was to play Division I college soccer. I'd been offered a scholarship, and not only was I going to play, I was going to start. So I showed up there, and I played soccer, and it just didn't feel like it had felt before. I just felt, like, anxious and uneasy. And I thought, you know what? I don't love soccer like I used to, and so I quit after one year. Looking back at it, it wasn't that I fell out of love with soccer. I fell in love with drugs and alcohol. And when I was playing soccer, I couldn't drink and party like I had, and I missed that feeling. That's the thing. When we choose drugs and alcohol, you got to choose one thing, and you got to let go of something else. And a lot of times, it's your hobbies and your passion and your friends. So in college, what I did, I partied, and I partied hard. I drank seven nights a week. I blacked out five of those. I smoked pot and I really got into cocaine and ecstasy. I made a lot of bad decisions. I was promiscuous. I had sex with guys I don't even know their names. I put myself in horrible situations. My story was being written. I had no idea. By the time I was a senior at BG, I was selling drugs. I was selling marijuana and cocaine. Not the story that I had envisioned for myself. And my mom would call me up and she'd be like, Stephanie, how's college? And I'd be like, everything's fine, everything's great, everything's wonderful. 
because I didn't want her to know that things weren't great. They weren't fine. Inside, I was dying, and I didn't even know it. But the thing was in college that I held on to, I knew if I got good grades, if I brought home that piece of paper that had good grades on it, nobody would ask any questions, right? We get good grades, must not be any problems. <laughs> right. But it worked for me. And so I graduated from BG with honors and addicted to cocaine. I was lucky that I even graduated. Most of the people that I became friends with in college were drug users and drug dealers. Most of those people, do you know where they're at today? Few of them are in jail. A few of them have died from drug overdoses. The majority of them, they still live in Bowling Green, Ohio. They still go to college parties. They still work at college bars. They are 35 years old. That's their story. I graduated and then I moved to Colorado because I love to snowboard and I was going to like live the dream. So I moved to Colorado and I'd been there about a week when guess what? I met a guy. And this was the guy now, you know, this was it. This guy and I, we had so much in common. We loved to snowboard and we loved to do drugs. <laughs> really? You need a little more than that for a relationship. But we were really popular. I thought we were just so cool. Really, we just had lots of drugs and money, and it's funny how many friends you have when you have drugs and money. And we were engaging in risky behavior. But I have this problem. And some of you guys, I know you have it too. Does anybody feel like the rules don't apply to them? Anybody admit that? Thank you, you brave, brave souls. Yeah, this whole table is like, yeah. <laughs> What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? I mean, like, this girl, she can have unprotected sex, and she would get pregnant. This girl, she can have unprotected sex, and she would get pregnant. Me and you, we can have all the unprotected sex we want. We're not going to get pregnant, right? Because those girls are. It's not going to happen to us. We are special. My mommy told me so. <laughs> right? We think we are ab above the law of the land. But at the age of 22, I realized the rules apply to me and all of you. I came up pregnant. Now life was getting serious. I wasn't ready to have a baby. I had gotten into some serious drugs. I was actually smoking crack at the time. And don't think that first time I smoked a joint in high school that I thought one day I'll be smoking crack. But we make decisions and they put us on paths to other decisions. Know where you're going. So I'm pregnant at the age of 22, and I make a decision I thought I would never make. I have an abortion. Decisions you make today, they're going to impact your life forever. I am living it. I had the abortion and I didn't tell anybody because I don't tell anybody anything. I just put that mask up and it's, everything's fine, everything's wonderful, everything's perfect. And I just do more drugs and more alcohol to cover up the pain. Pain that I still feel today. And then I had two scares with drug overdoses in Colorado and I said, you know what, I gotta move home. So I moved back to Ohio. And when I came back to Ohio, I was like, okay, it's time to be an adult. It's time to get a real job and like stop all this craziness. So I got a job and like everything else in the world that I had done, I was super successful, super fast. I started making more money, I was getting promoted, things were going great, I was still dabbling in cocaine and drinking and I made a decision, I'm like, I gotta stop doing drugs. Cause I don't wanna be some like 65 year old lady like, you know, hitting the bong and like sorting lines off my coffee table. I mean, that is not okay. So I made the decision I have to stop doing drugs and so I just stopped. And people are always like, oh, did you go through withdrawal? Were you shaking? Did you throw up? And I didn't really go through withdrawal. Instead, what I felt was emotional overload. I felt guilt and shame and fear and anxiety, depression, sadness, anger, pain that I had never felt before. And I realized that I had spent the last eight, ten years of my life covering up all my pain with drugs and alcohol. And that pain, even when you cover it up, it's still there. 
And I was like, oh, this does not feel good. So I said, I don't want to feel like this, but I don't want to go back to doing drugs. So what am I going to do? And I thought, you know what? If I just looked a little bit prettier, that always makes us feel better. So I started to diet. And, you know, lose a little, gain a little, lose a little, gain a little. You know, dieting, that's a whole other day. But it really wasn't working. And then one night, I came home and I'd eaten something that I thought was really bad. And so I made a decision I thought I would never make. And I made myself throw up. My story was being written. Because when I threw up, I didn't just throw up food. I threw up that guilt, that shame, that pain, that fear, that anxiety, that sadness, that depression, that rage. It all came up with it. And for one moment, I felt like, ah, this feels good. You know, and I was like, oh, but I'm never going to do that again. Yeah, about a week later, I felt all those emotions come back. And I was like, I'll just do it one more time. Within two months, I was throwing up three, four, eight, ten, twenty times a day. I was in the middle of a full-blown eating disorder. At the same time, my job is going really well. I would walk into my office, I would put that mask on, I would have a cute little outfit on, and I'd be like, everything's fine, everything's great, everything's wonderful. Nobody knew inside that I was dying, literally. That I had th started throwing up blood on occasion. That at night my heart felt like it was going to beat out of my chest. That I was fracturing every relationship with every family member, all of my friends. I had nothing. So I said to myself, okay, you got to stop throwing up. So one day I stopped throwing up. Because I stopped eating. And I went from full-blown bulimia to full-blown anorexia in a very short time. And I started to lose weight. And people started to take notice. And at the age of 25, I checked myself into my first treatment center for an eating disorder. It was outpatient. It was Laurelwood Hospital on the east side of Cleveland. And I showed up there like I do everything in life. I was like, I am going to be the perfect eating disorder patient. I am going to do recover, recovery faster than anybody. I'm going to be the prettiest and most popular girl here. It's going to be fabulous. I can't get real. I wasn't ready to get real. I didn't realize the decisions that I was making. And so I just lied my way through treatment, and I got out, and I was doing a little better. I mean, it worked a little bit, but with addiction, it's all or nothing. And so I got out, and I was at a bar one night, and I was drunk, and I met this guy, and he was drunk. And we went home, and we had sex. Bad idea. But when you mix me and alcohol, I turn into a complete idiot. And I'm not an exception to the rule. I know, you hear people say like, oh, I can hold my liquor. I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> it, we turn into complete fools and we think, oh no, I'm the exception. The rules apply to all of you. So this guy and I, we woke up the next day and we introduced ourselves to each other. And, uh, and then we did it the next day and the next day and the next day. And before I knew it, a year later, I woke up, I looked over, I'm in a relationship with this guy, we're living together, and I don't like this guy at all. And you're like, how do I end up here? We make decisions which put us on paths to other decisions. And then other decisions and other decisions. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in a place and you're like, how did I get here? The decision you made a long time ago put you there. So this guy and I are dating and everyone's like, oh, you guys are going to get married. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to be really drunk for that wedding. <laughs> and I mean, this is not the guy. When I'm drunk and he's drunk, he is perfect. Right? But when, when I'm sober and he's sober, it's no. He's not perfect. At the same time, this company had come and recruited me, and I was making about $125,000. Sweet! You know, I mean, I'm like 27. I'm like, this is awesome! Deep down, though, I hated my job. I absolutely hated it. So I'm living this life. I'm, this story is being written, and I don't even like it. But it's what other people want from me. And then at the age of 27, I realized that the rules apply to me. Once again, I come up pregnant. Once again, I decide to have an abortion. Decisions you make today 
They're going to impact your life forever. I'm living it. I can stop drinking. I can stop doing drugs. I can change jobs. I can change guys. I cannot take back two abortions, no matter what I do. And I stand here before you now. I do not support abortion in any form or fashion. It makes no difference. Those decisions are permanent. And I have to live with them every single day day. This wasn't supposed to be my story. Even as I get up in front of you and I tell this story all the time, in the back of my head, I'm hearing myself say, how did this happen? This wasn't supposed to happen to me. This wasn't the story I envisioned. I didn't know that the decisions in elementary school to have boyfriends would lead to hooking up with guys in junior high and then having sex in high school and then getting pregnant at 22 and having an abortion and then getting pregnant at 27 and having an abortion. I didn't know. But I'm telling you, the decisions you're making right now, they are going to have an impact on your life. You are headed somewhere and I hope you know where you're going. I had the abortion and again, don't tell anybody. Everything's fine, everything's great, everything's perfect. About a week later, I get this horrible pain in my stomach. And I drive myself to the emergency room because I know something is wrong. I get to the emergency room, I pass out in the ER. I wake up, they ran some tests, and I was bleeding to death internally. I had been pregnant with twins. One of those babies had been aborted, the other baby was in my fallopian tube and it had burst. I had lost two thirds of my blood and had less than two hours to live. So they have to do this surgery and this nurse, she looks over my bed and she says, okay, we're about to put you under. I just want you to know that when you wake up, you probably will never be able to have children. Decisions you're making right now can impact your life forever. They saved my life. I woke up, my surgeon came in, and she said, girl, somebody's got plans for you. You shouldn't have lived, number one. And number two, we didn't have to take any of your reproductive organs. We don't know if they work, but they're there. And so this was only four, five years ago. And after that, I just felt like my life started to go downhill. It happened in February, March, April, May, I was recovered, and my mom and I took a trip to Florida where we watched my uncle die of lung cancer. Life happens. Two days later, my aunt on the way to his funeral died unexpectedly. Yeah. What? It happens. A month later, just when you think, like, what else? I found out that the guy that I'd been living with had cheated on me right after I had my surgery and being pregnant with his babies. And I went to what I know best, my eating disorder. And I started losing weight. And about three and a half years ago, I got down to such a low weight that I was about to lose my mom. I was about to lose my dad. I was going to lose my friends. I was going to lose everything. I was going to die. So I made a decision, and this is a decision that impacted my life in a way I could never have imagined. I decided to check myself into rehab. I went to a place called Remuda Ranch. It's a Christian-based treatment center. And I heard that word Christian. I was like, oh boy, here we go. Well, not only are they going to shove food down my throat, but they are going to shove God down my throat. And don't get me wrong. I believed in God. I was all about that, you know, but I didn't want to be, like, thumped with a Bible. And I got there, and I was there for a couple weeks, and when you're in rehab, you have a lot of time to think. And I thought about my life, and I, like, compared my life to a car. It, it was a pretty car. But every time I got behind the wheel of that car, I would slam that car right into the wall over and over and over again. And I thought to myself, Stephanie, how is it going to be different? What are you going to do different? Are you going to go home, get back in the driver's seat, and slam into that wall again? What is going to be different? And I've been hearing all this God talk. And so I made a decision right there, and I said, I'm going to give my life to Christ. And I literally went to God, and I said, all right, man, you are like big God. You created everything. You are awesome. But I'm going to give you 24 hours to change my life. Yeah, I work quick. <laughs> Didn't give him a lot of time there, but he doesn't need it. Because the thing was, is my way wasn't working. So I was going to try God's way. And if his way didn't work, I was going to try somebody else's. I was just going to go down the line. 
But I just knew my way wasn't working. And I woke up the next day and no, no angel appeared to me or anything like that. But I felt purpose and meaning that I had never felt before. And when you feel purpose in your life, you go from just existing to living and everything changes. And I started to eat and I started to get better. Three and a half years ago, I came home after three months in rehab. Three and a half years ago, I decided that I was going to live by a different set of rules. I stopped drinking. I stopped smoking. I stopped having sex. I uh, stopped throwing up. I stopped doing drugs. I stopped starving myself. I started doing crazy stuff like going to church and reading the Bible. I mean, I used to sell drugs. So for me, reading the Bible, that was a stretch. But I have to be really honest. I can't explain it, but it started to make sense. Life started to make sense. I tell people I started to see color again. I felt joy and peace and forgiveness that I had never felt. And I needed those things. Because life was bad. I had done some bad stuff. So I'd been home about six months. And I decided to walk away from my $125,000 job. I know. But I know, but I would rather be poor and happy than rich and miserable any day. And I knew that was not my purpose. And after that, this newspaper did an article on me about me and my struggle with an eating disorder. A teacher saw that article and she called me and said, hey, would you come in and talk to my, my class about eating disorders? And I said, okay. And so I had this awesome presentation about the education of eating disorders. I was going to solve the eating disorder problem of the world. I woke up that morning and God kind of smacked me right in the face and said, just tell the story. You are more than an eating disorder. It's more than that. Just tell the story. So I did. I went into a high school and I did five classes and I just told the story. And the next day, this girl jumps on Facebook and she said, Stephanie, I made a different decision today because of you. I want my story to be different. I about fell right off my chair. Because when your life impacts the life of others for good, I am telling you, it is the best high that there is. And I have tried all of them. So I know <laughs> you don't need to try them. But when your life makes a difference and when you let the bad be used for good, it is unbelievable. I spoke to two schools that first year. I spoke to a few more the next year. Last year, I spoke to ever over 10,000 high school students. I have not been trained in public speaking. This is not what I went to college for. I'm not, I'm not famous. I haven't done anything special. This is just my story. And I'm willing to tell it. About two years ago then, this guy asked me out on a date. He was from my church. And I Googled him, of course, because that's what we do now, right? <laughs> and when I Googled him, it came up that he was a professional wrestler in the WWE. I was like, not my type. I mean, that's weird. And, uh, but he kept bugging me, bugging me, bugging me, let's go out on a date. And so I said, okay, we'll go on a date. So we went and had coffee and we sat there and we sat for four hours. And I swear this is true. I told him everything. I just told you. Date number one. He, I hear how you're like, you're nuts. <laughs> he didn't run. He didn't run. We ended up getting a, married a year later. Yeah. <laughs> And about a month after that, after we got married, I found out I was pregnant. It was so awesome. We were so excited. And we went in for the ultrasound. They put this thing on your stomach, and you just hear, ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. And I'm like, whoo, what is that? And they're like, that's your baby. I was like, cool. And they're like, come back in a week. So we go back in a week. We invite my parents because we are so excited. We go into the room. They put it on there. Silence. There's no heartbeat. There's nothing. Then they tell me that I miscarried. In miscarriage, it happens. The thing is, is eating disorders increase your chance of future miscarriage. Drug use increases your chance of future miscarriage. Abortions increase your chance of future <laughs> miscarriage. Did I just have a miscarriage? Or was my miscarriage due to a decision I made a long time ago? Decisions you're making right now, guys, they count. They matter. A couple months after that, I got pregnant again. It was the most terrifying pregnancy of my life. 
because doctors didn't know if I could carry full term. And I'm happy to report that we welcomed our first son, Jacob Anthony Tolar. Five and a half months ago, he came into our lives, and it was an amazing day. So where am I now? My husband and I, we live in Medina with our little baby boy and our really annoying dog, Parker. We love him, but, you know, we live about a block from my parents. We have a really good relationship now. I work at Grace Church part-time. I do graphic design. I work with youth ministry. I speak, and, and I'm really hoping to get a nonprofit company off the ground. So that's my story. Most people always say, wow, you have such a happy ending. That story was awesome. And it makes me cringe because I'm like, my story isn't awesome. My story is painful. It is full of tragedy and suffering and bad decisions. Now, God's story in my life, now that is awesome. But my story, it sucks. I would not wish it upon anybody. And don't get me wrong, I am blessed. I'm blessed I have a good husband, I have a, a family, a son, a job, friends. I'm blessed. But there has been a price to pay for the decisions I have made. My husband and I, we got married two years ago. At my wedding, not one person I knew from high school, college, or Colorado. Ten years of my life, and I don't have one relationship to show for it. Because all of my relationships are based off of drugs and alcohol. Every time I look at my son, I have to think about two decisions I made. Two children that I said, you weren't worth it. Every day I still battle with an eating disorder. Every day. It is harder now than it's been in a long time. I struggle with depression. I struggle with anxiety. I have thoughts of worthlessness. I just feel like I'm not good enough still. There is a price to pay for the decisions I've made. And while, yes, I have a lot of things, and life is good, I still live with and wear the emotional and physical scars of my decisions. So what's it going to be? What's your story going to be? Are the decisions you're making right now, are they putting you on a path to the story you want to write? Because your stories, they are important. This is an exciting time of your life. Your stories are being written right here and right now. And don't just think you wake up one day and think, oh, you know what, I think I'll get pregnant. Oh, you know what, I think I'll have an STD. No, we make decisions that put us on paths to other decisions and other decisions and other decisions. And then we end up places we don't want to be, we shouldn't be, and we're not ready to be. Where are you headed? Some of you might sit there and think, wow, maybe I'm not making the best decisions. I'm telling you today, it can be different. You can walk out of those doors a different person than you walked in. But talk to people. Don't just wear the mask. Get real because the rules apply to you. If you continue to make decisions that you know aren't right, you're going to end up in a place you don't want to be. And that's going to impact your life forever. I challenge you today. When you leave here, yes, think about what I've said and think about my story. But more than anything, think about your story. Decisions you make today are going to impact you for the rest of your life. And yes, the rules apply to each of you. Don't forget that. And more than anything, remind yourselves every day and embrace that your stories are being written right here and right now. Thank you very much. We'll return to our speaker in just a few moments. But first, we encourage you to formulate some questions now while we break for a few announcements. 
We welcome you to this City Club Youth Forum, part of the traditional Youth City Club, which began in 1912. It is the oldest continuous running free speech forum in the country. Today's City Club Youth Forum is made possible through grants from the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation, the Bruin Foundation, the Stalker Foundation, the William Weiss Foundation, and the Thomas White Foundation. We would like to thank our funders for their generous support. The City Club Youth Forum series is planned by Council of Students from local area high schools. I would like to thank the members of the Council whose names are in this program. Now we'd like to return to our speakers for traditional questions and answers. To ask a question, and must be questions only, please raise your hand. As a courtesy, please stand, say your name at school, and hold your applause until the end of our program. Our microphone holders are Justin Lee and Jesse Lee of Max Hayes High School. First question, please. Okay, where are we? Okay. <laughs> um, what age did your parents find out about your story, and what did they do to help you? What did they say? Oh, my parents found out my story um, when I was in rehab. So they came to visit me at treatment, and you do this whole family week, and I just decided, you know what? I'm going to just tell them the story. Um, and they both kind of looked at me and said, we're lucky that you're alive. And... They just gave me grace and loved me. You know, um, my parents have gone on the journey with me. It wasn't just my problem. A lot of times it's a family problem. And so they've been there and they're here today and they've been there every step of the way. They've gone to lots of family therapy. We've yelled at each other. We've cried together. We pray a lot. But our relationship has now been mended and they are amazing grandparents to my, my son. And so... Even if right now you may, might not have the best relationship with your parents, I'm telling you that in the future it can be different and it's really worth it. I think we need family in our lives. Uh, how you doing? My name's Maya and I go to High Tech Academy. And she's like, I do not need a microphone. <laughs> I just want to know, like, do you want to hug? Because I, I really wanted to get up and hug you, but yes, I didn't want to be give me a hug. <laughs> But I gotta be honest, um, it's not easy. You know, I, I've, I've told this story a lot, I speak a lot, and I've told this story a lot. It, it never gets easier, and, and I, I really don't want it to, because I want you guys to realize that, that there is pain, and it, there's reality in decisions that you make in your life, and, and that's why I think it's, it's the truth. And I wanna give that to you, and I'm okay with being emotional, because it's real, you know, and it's, it's, you guys need more truth in your lives. Okay, hello. Um, I go to John Hay Early College and High Tech Academy. I wanted to know when you said that when you was at Bowling Green, you was like, as long as you maintain the good grades, they didn't know. So did you really was able to maintain good grades and do all the drugs and stuff? I don't know how, but I was able to maintain good grades. And that meant I didn't sleep a lot of nights. I mean, I would go to computer labs, you know, completely on drugs. And, it, you know, I was making bad decisions. And... Sometimes I wish I could tell students, you know, oh, I dropped out and, you know, but the reality is I didn't. I'm like, I've always had this real overachiever thing and I can just, I put my mind to something and I can do it. So it was almost like I lived two different lives. But I know I was one of the lucky ones because like I said, the majority of people that I hung out with, they weren't so lucky. It doesn't work. You know, I mean, you go to college and I was just talking to the, the council and said, if I could go back what a different experience it would be. I'm Spencer Kiesel. Do you plan on doing more public speaking in the future? Yes, I do, Spencer. <laughs> um, I never thought this is what I would be doing. I, I never, ever thought I would be up in front of students or people talking about really anything. Um, but I absolutely love it. And I feel that I have a story that I need to share. And it would be selfish of me to live my life and not share that story. 
and to see the impact that it will have sometimes on a student. I mean, if one person in this room makes one different decision, I, I mean, that's amazing. And so to see the impact that can be had if just by getting up and being honest, it's awesome. So yes, I continue to plan on continuing to keep doing it. Hello, my name is Joshua Clancy. I'm from Shaw High School. What made you want to start use drugs and how did you get introduced to drugs? Okay, good question. In high school, you know, I was in an abusive relationship and I felt so much pain from that. And then I went to a party one night and I was offered alcohol. And, you know, I think for a long time in my life I said, I will never drink, I will never do drugs. But then you put yourself, you make a decision and you put yourself in that situation and I couldn't deal with the peer, peer pressure. It is intense, right? When somebody approaches you to use drugs or alcohol or your boyfriend or girlfriend is like, hey, let's do this, it is hard to say no. I didn't want to be like the dorky kid who said no, you know, and so I just went along with it. Little did I know, though, that that decision at that party was going to lay the groundwork for the rest of my life. You know, and that's what I'm talking about. These decisions that seem like, oh, one drink, not a big deal. But what that did is that opened the door. And some doors, trust me, you just don't want to open. Hi, I'm Maggie Bishop from St. Joseph Academy. And I was wondering if you believe that finding God earlier in your life would have changed your story or if God entered your life at the point most important. I think, great question, I think that, um, you know, it's hard because it's like you can't go back, but I do think that if God would have come into my life earlier, I would have had a much different story. People always ask me this question, they say, if you would have heard yourself speak, would that have changed your decisions? And I think about that and I said, you know what, I wish I would have had the opportunity. I wish I would have had that option but I'd never heard anything like this. You know, I just was taught out of the textbooks and, you know, and, and so, but I think that if God would have come into my life earlier and God was a part of my family, but I didn't have a relationship with God. And that is the big difference for me right now. Hi, I'm Carolyn Plata. I'm also from St. Joseph Academy. And I was wondering, do you have a plan to tell your son your story? And when do you think you'll be ready or he'll be ready to hear it well I told it to him like five times this morning but <laughs> he's five and a half months so he just laughs at me um, and, <laughs> no um my husband and I we've talked about this and I, I definitely have a plan to talk to him especially because I'm so public about it I would never want him to find something out that I didn't share with him but I'm definitely going to keep it age appropriate so along the way I'm really hoping and praying that we can share with him as he grows up what he needs to know because I do talk to a lot of students who tell me that when their parents share some mistakes that they've made, that it makes a big impact on their life. And so I hope to be able to parent that way as well and use it to help him to hopefully avoid some of it. Who was the first person you told your story to? Oh, the first person I told my story to. When I went to treatment for my eating disorder at Remuda Ranch, when you go to rehab, they have you write down your life story. And I didn't think I had like a crazy story. I thought that the people are going to be bored. This is stupid. And so the first time I told it was in front of a group of 25 girls that were also there for eating disorders. And I expected people to judge me, to kind of make fun of me. And it was the first time that I had received grace from other people. They loved me more. Because I've learned when we take off that mask, the other person takes off the mask too, right? And so then you can get real with each other. The brighter and the more made up my mask is, the brighter and more made up the mask of the person I'm talking to is too. And you just have that generic conversation. When we start to take that down, we can start to get real and have real relationships that are meaningful. Um. Hi, my name is Taylor Young, and I'm from Cleveland Heights High School. <clears throat> what I wanted to say really wasn't a question, but it was a comment. 
I just wanted to say that I really appreciate everything that you said. It's really genuine. It's I know it's not hard to come up here and share your experience, but it's just God is so good. To see you go from a trial and, and see how he brought you out. You have a child and you, you recover from everything. You have a husband and, you know, I know what you went through wasn't the best, but you get to come and talk to all us about it. And we live in a generation where teens, including myself, want to do what we want and we don't want to listen to our parents. <laughs> so it was just like, it was just really good to hear your story. I just wanted to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brianna Davis. I'm from Shaw High School. I want to ask you, did you write a book or do you plan on writing a book? Oh, that's a question I get all the time. Um, I have not written a book, um, but God is really nudging, now shoving me to do, <laughs> he does that when we don't listen, um, he's um, really encouraging me to do that, so um, I'm actually starting to film a bunch of my talks as well, um, but I, I need to write it, because again, it's selfish for me not to, just to share the story, so thank you for the encouragement though, that helps me. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm also from Heights. It's really hard to go after Taylor. She really summed it all up. Thank you very much. But um, my question was, after you got out of rehab the second time, was it, I know it was really hard, but did you ever like fall off the wagon at all after that? Yeah. Like, how did it go? It was really hard. When I got out of treatment, like I said, I've been out about three and a half years. And eating disorders, they take five to seven years to recover from. And most people don't ever recover from them. And like I said, right now, you know, I just had a baby like six months ago and I'm really battling with my eating disorder. And when I came home, I spent a year of my life and I went to like three therapy appointments a day, I, or a week, I saw doctors, I went to groups. So I had all this intense support around me. And like right now, that's what I need to get back to or I'm gonna fall off the wagon. Um, when I came home, I, I never thought like I wouldn't drink. Um, but when I came home, I said, I'm just not going to drink. And, and people always ask me, Oh, do you think drinking's bad or it's a sin? And it's like, no, I don't think it's bad or a sin. But for me, it causes me to do sinful things. It causes me to just be an idiot and screw up. And so I just couldn't put myself in that situation. So have I completely like fallen off or anything? I would say no but every day is a struggle and I don't always make the right decision, but I just want to keep being honest with you guys about it. Cause I want you to understand it's not easy. It's a lifelong battle that I will deal with. And the temptation is still there. Hi, my name is, um, during Higgins and I attend the Cleveland school of science and medicine. I just wanted to know if you had plans to like go back to Colorado and maybe, help the people since they don't seem to be trying to help themselves. <laughs> Do I have plans to go to Colorado? Well, you'd have to ask my husband that. No, um, I don't think I have plans to go back to Colorado. I think, I think our home is in Ohio. I mean, I don't know, you know, God does crazy things. They don't know what he has planned, but, um, I, I really feel strong about this. I think there's enough people in the community that I live in to help. You know, I think there's enough young people, there's enough youth. I mean, you know, you guys move up and out of high school and there's just somebody there to replace you. And, and personally, I think you guys have, have it a lot tougher than I did. I mean, I want to be real honest about that. I just think it's hard to be a teenager today. And so um, no plans to go back to Colorado. Maybe a snowboarding trip or something like that would be cool. But, but that would be it, just a vacation. Uh -oh. Hello, my name is Shaquille Tyson from Shaw High School. First, I would like to say thanks for coming up here and telling, our, uh, telling your story to us. But my question is, if you think you can take your memories from what happened to in the past and live a whole different story, would you be, uh, would you, and had a second chance to live a different story, would you do that or do you think the same uh, situations would occur again? So if I could go back, would I change things? Yeah, it's a good question, and I think about that a lot. I guess I feel like it was okay to endure the pain that I've endured because of the impact that I get to make today. And, like, I can't go back. But somebody's got to be up here. You know, somebody's got to share their story and talk 
the truth to you guys. I mean, you're not going to learn a lot of stuff in textbooks, you know? And so when I really do think about that question, I don't think I would go back. I think I would say, you know what? I'll deal with the consequences if I get to continue to make the impact that I've been allowed to make. Hello again. Um, my question is, would you um, tell your story to your son? And um, <laughs> was, uh, oh, would you be open with them the way you think he should be open with, you know, a father and mother and son relationship? Yeah, I think, I mean, again, we would tell, tell our son um, that it would be age appropriate. So, like, along the way, I don't think just dropping this on my son when he's, like, 10 would probably be the best idea. It might mess him up a little bit. But, um, <laughs> you know, the beauty is, is that my husband and I both have had some rough paths. And God has brought us to a place that we're aware of a lot of that. And so we know we're going to screw him up in some ways, but we just hope it's different than the ways we were screwed up in. <laughs> so, but we're going to try to be as transparent with our son as possible. Uh, hello, my name is Antonio Gardner. I go to Shaw High School. And I wanted to ask you a specific question about the drug use. Um, how did you make the transfer from smoking things like marijuana, which is a small level drugs, to going up to big things like cane and and crack that right. you know personally. Right. Because you never because you never think, you know, I never thought in high school, like when I smoked that first joint, I never thought, you know, like, oh, this is gonna lead to me smoking crack one day, right? But that's the key, is that I smoked marijuana and then so I got into that and then uh, probably about six months later, somebody offered me mushrooms. And so I was like, Well, I'm doing that. And I was probably high at the time, and so you don't make good decisions then anyway. And so then I opened the door to that, right? And then it just progresses. And then it's once you compromise, once you open that door a little bit, you got to be careful because you don't know what's on the other side. You know, and it's the same. It's like, I mean, when it comes down to it, sex is very similar. You've got to be careful what you're willing to compromise because you open that door just to crack, and you're putting yourself on a path that you're not ready for, and I wasn't ready for. I mean, if I ever thought, like, that I would stand up here and be like, oh, yes, I've smoked crack. I never thought that. I mean, really? It's not something to be, like, proud of, you know? But, like, I made decisions that led to other decisions, that led to other decisions that put me in a living room at 3 o'clock in the morning, and somebody offered me crack. And I made another decision. And that's why I'm telling you guys, the decisions you're making right now, I know they seem insignificant, but they're taking you somewhere. <laughs> My name is Brianna Brown. I also go to Shaw High School and bounce off of Antonio's question. Okay. What point did you realize that you were an addict? What <laughs> what happened that made you see that it was just out of control? I realized I was an addict in rehab. Right? I mean, because when you're in it, you're not an addict. Like, I, when I was in it, you know, when I was doing cocaine every single night of the week and, like, would do anything to get more cocaine, I never thought I was an addict. You know, addicts were, like, people who, like, lived under bridges and, like, you know, like, were missing teeth or something. Like, that wasn't me, right? I didn't look like that. And, like, I was still good in good grades, and so I couldn't be an addict. And then when I went to rehab, I realized that I am a full-blown addict. I mean, you tell me to learn about elephants, I will go and buy five books, a DVD, a CD, buy tickets to, you know, Africa, and you are going to be like, well, I just wanted to know what color they were. You know, that's my personality. It's very, like, all or nothing, and that's a really good thing, but you just have to be careful. I just have to be aware, and I have to keep a balance. So I didn't realize I was an addict, and I'm still learning about me as an addict and what that means. I'm still learning about that. Good afternoon. My name is Justin Hogue, a member of the City Club of Cleveland Youth Forum Council and currently a senior at High Tech Academy. 
Today at this city club of Cleveland Youth Forum, we have been listening to Stephanie Sizemore Tolar. Before you go, we would like to ask you to fill out the surveys on your tables and return them at the door. Thank you to our speaker, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The forum is now adjourned.